The following content is for entertainment and educational purposes only. It does not constitute means for diagnosis, healthcare advice, nor treatment. Make use of a qualified healthcare professional for such purposes. everyone, my name is Dr. Charlene Ortiz and today we are going to continue our lecture in memory. We have previous, previous installments that I will link in the description below for those of you who are watching at home or for those of you here who just simply want a refresher. So today we're going to continue with issues of memory, for example, forgetting and also the structures that are involved in the learning process and retention. So let's get started. All right, so one of the things that we know in psychology, because psychology is a soft science, which means that the confidence interval to which we can make assertions generally falls within the 95% range, but, but in the hard sciences or your physics and things like that, it usually falls in the 99 percentage. Generally, we don't have as many laws or as many, as many laws, I should say, that are pretty solid. Let's just use that term for now. But this is one of the few, right? This is one of the few that we do have. And here we are talking about the Ebenhaus forgetting curve. Now, what do we know about the Ebenhaus's forgetting curve? This comes from an experiment. This comes from an experiment that was conducted on himself, right? So he started with himself first in 1885. And what happened was that he was trying to show how rapid, how quickly do we tend to forget things that we had just learned, right? And generally, you will think, well, I can keep stuff for a little while. You know, it still rattles around. If I shake my head, it's still in there, right? But surprisingly, notice that in this case, right, what occurred and what generally occurs whenever you are exposed to something new. So for example, this lecture, this lecture tends to be like an hour-ish, give or take. So notice that at the very beginning, right, you're able to retain most information, but notice that within 20 minutes, right, you already forgot 40% of what I just told you. So this is very discouraging for me as your instructor, right? So within, if you don't have any rehearsal, if you don't have any practice, you will start forgetting most things basically around this range. So just within 20 minutes, you only remember about 60%. And then notice that within a day, just tomorrow, you're probably on a good day are going to remember about 30% of whatever was been taught to you. So how is it that Enhouse conducted this study? Well, he used something that we like to refer to the nonsense syllables, the nonsense syllables. And I'll actually give you an example of what that looks like. So what occurs is that you're going to present a consonant, consonant, vowel, consonant arrangement, right? So I'm going to present it with a consonant, vowel, right? And then another one, another consonant. And generally, they do not represent any actual words, right? So they generally don't represent an actual word. And this is so we can make it a little bit more difficult for the person to do any sort of semantic association, right? And what do I mean by that? If you recall from our previous lectures, we talked about how semantic, every time you hear the term semantic, you're going to hear the word meaning, right? So he wanted it to be basically bizarre. He wanted it to be nonsense because he wanted to measure whether or not he was able to remember words without meaning, right? Nonsense. So, so that we can only focus on memory factors instead of semantic factors. So I'll show you a small and very brief example of what that looks like. All right, so let's look at this example. 
So notice that within this software, right, the person is able to select either three letter words or nonsense. Now in this specific one, the participant selected um, three letter words, and you're only gonna have a very short amount of time to look at these words. So you're presented with a visual stimuli, there's no noise, there's no sound, and then the participant is asked to very quickly attempt to recall which words he came across with. But notice that as time progresses, right, if we were to ask the person to identify the original terms, right, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. Just as Evan House suggested that forgetting occurs immensely quickly. It's a process that occurs immensely quickly. So in this particular case, a person is still conducting and being exposed to visual stimuli and later to refer to his memory, see how many he can recall from the previous exposure of stimuli. There are many ways in how this study has been conducted. It has been conducted with colors. It has been conducted with many other variations just so that we can understand if there are any differences. For example, some people may have an issue recording, or I should say remembering words, but perhaps numbers or colors are a little bit easier for this person to understand. So it is a pretty neat uh, exercise to show um, here in class. Oh, there it is. There it is. For some of you, this is a first word, right? Some of you, I want to see that word, right? And as I illustrated earlier, the capability of this person to being able to remember actually can decrease over time. So say if I were to give the same stimuli to this person an hour from now, if, if the person did not rehearse, then notice that their ability to remember is going to significantly start increasing over time. So are there any questions about that? Good deal which is one of the reasons why people give out homework. However, homework does have some value when it comes to remembering. The problem that I have with homework is that it provides measurements and if it's graded, then it's basically adding another stressor, if you will. So that's generally, I'd rather you guys just sit down and study and remember and try to rehearse the material. So it is really important to study. So you guys are always welcome to schedule an appointment with me so we can basically not have this issue. Rather, we're able to sustain a higher learning curve, right? Speaking of which, this is the illustration of this forgetting curve, right? It's the ability to be able to re retain the information, how much we forget over time. So any questions about the Ebbinghaus nonsense syllables experiments or the learning curve? or forgetting curve, I should say. Right, so really interesting. Why is it that we forget, right? Why is it that we forget? There are two aspects that we can consider at first in order to explain why is it that we forget. One of them is pseudo forgetting, pseudo forgetting. This is when we think we forgot something, but in reality, we just never learned it. Right? It just never landed, right? It, we never actually retained that information, right? This information was never part of your memory. It simply never made it there. So it feels like you forgot something, but in reality, you never did. You never really forgot anything because there was nothing to forget in the first place. Now, generally, we can say, I can attribute pseudo forgetting to lack of attention. So for example, something that you're discussing, we're discussing here, you're like, I don't remember when Dr. Shah talked about that topic. It might've been simply that you weren't paying attention. It might've been simply that the message didn't land firsthand. And I'll give you a more colorful example, being hungover. Hungover and being blacked out is an example of pseudo forgetting. A lot of people think, you know, you went out on a party, you get back home, and then the next day your friends are like, oh, you did this, and you jumped up on the fence, and 
you did all this crazy stuff and you started dancing, thinking that you could twerk and you could not. And then the person starts saying, I don't remember any of that. It's not that you forgot, you have pseudo forgetting. Your brain is shut down and never had the ability to actually retain that information, right? So being blacked out is an example of pseudo forgetting, right? Because the information never made it there in the first place. Your brain was out. So there was no opportunity for your brain to get that information in the first place. So any questions about ineffective encoding or for example, pseudo forgetting? Good deal. Let's talk about decay which is very in accordance with our forgetting curve. As you know, as time progresses, we start forgetting the information, right? So as time moves forward, our retention decreases. This is an example of a negative correlation, by the way, for those of you who hate statistics. So simply put, we basically forget because of time. You will fade away. Memory will fade away because of time. Generally, decay only affects my sensory and short-term memory. And if you recall, if I clear my slide, remember that our sensory memory is that that we only need for a very, very, very short amount of time. So for example, looking at this image, and basically retaining that information for less than a second to notice, oh, this is in English, it's blue, right? It's in this sort of writing. So that's the amount of sensory memory. Now, when we're talking about short term, remember that this is the information that we generally store up for about 20 seconds, right? So the K generally tends to affect these two types of memory the strongest, right? Now, that is because we have been unable, right? We have been unable to ascertain whether or not BK affects long-term memory forgetting. There are other aspects that are more substantiated when it comes when you forget something that was already in your long-term. We're actually going to cover that very shortly. Any questions about why is it that we forget, whether it be because we never encoded, right? That code never came in in the first place or because it did come in, but however, it started decreasing. It started decaying. All right, good deal. Let's talk about a little bit more in detail as to why we can forget. Now, this is really interesting because I just met with a student that wanted new techniques for, um, for studying, right? How is it that I can do better in, in my test, right? And interestingly, I explained this theory to my student, which is interference theory. What is interference theory? We tend to forget information because there is competition, right? There is competition as to if I only have this limited amount of space, right? And I try to store this piece of information and this piece of information, right? Almost like when you're looking at your memory storage in a computer, notice that other pieces of information, right? That I need to store in my memory will compete for this space. Therefore, remembering your third grade's name, the, the, your teacher's name from third grade, Notice that this is going to interfere, intervene. It's going to interfere with that particular information. So notice that I actually started explaining this to, to the student because sometimes we have competing material. Sometimes there's stuff, you have a psychology exam, you have a sociology exam, you have a philosophy exam. These are topics that are related, right? So now your brain is competing for certain types of information. And even though, let's assume that you learned what Evan House did with the nonsense syllables, notice that maybe you're going to need that information for yet again another piece of information. And it's going to interfere, right, with that particular piece of information. So any questions about interference theory? 
regret. Let's talk a little bit more about retroactive interference. Here we're getting a little bit more specific, right? We're getting a little bit more specific because we have retroactive and proactive. Let's start with retroactive first. This is when you have a new piece of information, right? You have a new piece of information saying what we just learned about Evan House's forgetting curve, right? This is your new info. But what it occurs is that it's going to impair the retention of something that you previously learned. So for example, in the past, you have learned something, so old information, right? And in this particular case, gaining new access to new information is going to impair this retention to the point where eventually this information is no longer going to be retained. Conversely, you also have proactive interference, which is basically the opposite of retroactive. So notice that in this particular case, what it occurs is that old information that you already had, right, old information that you already have, is going to interfere with your ability of learning new information, right? So for example, we just learned about Evan House's learning curve, I should say, forgetting curve. But notice in my case, for example, I know a lot about the learning curve, right? As it's very clear by my little Freudian slips of class. So I'm going to use that mistake as an example. So notice that I keep saying learning curve instead of forgetting curve. That is because this old piece of information that I have in my head is interfering with me being able to retain and establish this new memory. So notice how now is the opposite. Now, my ability to learn new information is being impacted, right? It's being impacted. That retention is being impacted by my previously learned information, my old info. So any questions about that? Good deal. You're thinking, why does that matter, right? Why does that matter? Well, I like to think about some aspects of therapy, right? So for example, you might have learned in the past, although we can make a case for observational learning and things of that nature. Um, but you might have learned in the past, right? So if, if a client grew up thinking and seeing and learning, every time mom was angry, mom uh, will punch dad and then dad would turn around and punch her back, right? Or vice versa. So notice that we have learned that it, showing anger is the right way to get our point across. But then when you go to therapy, we're trying to teach you new ways to communicate other than aggression. Sure, you can use aggression to communicate your thoughts, right? I'm pretty sure that works all the time when you're being coerced, right? So for example, through violence or aggression or the threat of, you have learned that if you want something, all I have to do is what mom and dad used to do and slap each other in the face, right? So when you go to therapy and you're trying to learn something new, right? Now, what we're coming across is proactive interference. It's really difficult for you to gain and learn and retain this information because now that was great, right? It's very difficult for this person to learn. Perhaps this is not the best way, right? Perhaps this is not the best way for you to communicate my, my message. Any questions about that? All right, good deal. So let's revert back to our slides. Now, this is another concern, right? Another issue why we may forget things. So notice that in this particular case, you have encoding, right? You have encoded, there was no issues. You weren't hangover, right? You didn't black out. Encoding was processed correctly. You didn't have issues with attention. And then when we start moving to the storage, right? You did store all the information. But then when we are trying to go back, right? And retrieve said information, we, and we start having issues, that can explain why we forget. There is something wrong in this process, right? There is something wrong in my ability to going back. So this is failing. There is an issue in my ability to process retrieval. Now, generally, we can explain an issue, a breakdown of this set communication 
between me being able, if I raise it here, you will have basically a break. I have a break through which this does not happen. We're not able to retrieve that information. Something that we like to think about that facilitates this break, right? When something is not being able to be retrieved is the specificity principle based on encoding. What is that? That's simply a very fancy term to explain that the value of this retrieval, the value of my ability to retrieve information, it's going to depend based on how well we have coded that information, right? Because we already have a retrieval queue. Right? What does that mean in regular good old American English, right? What does that mean? It means that, for example, everything was encoded correctly. I was paying attention. I wasn't hungover. I wasn't intoxicated. So it encoded correctly. It moved into my sensory, short term, and long term. So I was able to store the information. When I'm trying to retrieve it, now the argument is perhaps the cues that you have utilized in order to remember that set piece of information weren't good. So you thought that thinking, oh yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Shar's first name, what's her first name? I can't remember and I have it right here. Perhaps it's because you didn't use, right? My first name Charlene, by the way. <laughs> For those of you like, why is it this Charlene? Uh, I never hear it, by the way, it's usually Dr. Ortiz or Dr. Shar, I never hear Charlene. It's like, I feel like I'm in trouble with my parents. I like, oh, need to, you know, you know, sit up straight, button on my shirt correctly, right? So in this particular case, it could be that you're forgetting my name because you didn't use the appropriate cue in order to remember that piece of information. Any questions about that? Good deal. This one is perhaps the most interesting for those of you who are in the field of psychology, and that is motivated forgetting. Motivating, motivated forgetting, I should say. This is our natural tendency to forget about things we simply don't want to remember, right? Things that we simply do not want to think about, right? We just simply don't want to talk, talk about it, think about it, rehearse it in any way. Right. A really important element of motivated forgetting is repression. Right. Repression. In regards of repression, what occurs is that generally things that are anxiety producing, thoughts that are distressing, thoughts that are anxiety producing, thoughts that are stressful, for example, trauma, a very difficult event, a very difficult circumstance, right? Notice that in this case, we're going to try and put those thoughts under our unconscious, right? We're trying to move these thoughts away from my consciousness. So this would be my consciousness. It's actually like an iceberg, really. So it would be if I were to erase all this, and you, will act, you guys will actually see that later on. So it's basically like an iceberg. Right. So here we have your alert consciousness, and then we start thinking about the subconscious and then the unconscious. So the argument is that whenever we have a memory that we simply do not want to remember, it's just going to be passed down into your unconscious. There are many aspects that we, particularly in therapy, um, it's not something that I generally specialize in. I do have, there's one of our interns that does specialize in that. She is super great. She's from South Carolina and she moved down here to the South. She's a school teacher. And now she's moving uh, towards the therapy side of things. She's a teacher by trade, has been doing it for 10, 15 years. And now she decided, I want to be able to do something firsthand to help these children. She works with early, early, early childhood children. And she decided to move to that side. Because of that, her idea is that aspects that are formed during childhood are the ones that cause issues as adults. So she considers that repression. It's immensely significant when it comes to trauma and how individuals carry themselves. So she does specialize a lot in that right now in her training as, a, as an intern. So she, she's really specialized in, in that or is specializing, I should say. 
about that. So any questions about either retrieval failure or motivated forgetting? Good deal, good deal. All right, so let's go back to our slides. Now, there are, there are some issues, right? Repression does not come without controversy, right? Generally, it does not come without controversy. That is because there are some issues and some milestones, some aspects that would need to happen during therapy that allow the process of learning and basically bringing these memories up to the conscious. Now, there are certain factors. There are certain factors that are difficult sometimes for clients and us and practitioners, right, or students to remember. The first thing is basically accepting, right, accepting those recovered memories, accepting abuse at face value. I see this an awful lot in practice. I really see this an awful lot. People will not call the sky blue. It is very difficult for people to accept and label things for what they are. That is because people tend to forget that abuse is more common than what most of us like to realize. That is because we are naturally inclined, right? We are naturally inclined to bury traumatic incidents into our unconscious. I like to think about if, if this helps to have a medical parallel, I like to think about repression as your immune system, right? Your immune system is there to repress an antigen that is trying to a foreign body that is trying to affect you, right? For those of you who are in nursing or in the medical field, all of you know that your immune system is there to basically suppress, to basically try to minimize the impact of that body, that foreign body that is trying to attack you. And I like to think about repression in the same way. Instead of being a bacteria for your immune system, here it would be a trauma. This trauma is trying to attack your state of mind. So for example, your homeostasis of being calm and being chill, being content, because now it's anxiety producing, it's distressing. Just like you naturally suppress bacteria whenever you're exposed to it because of your immune system, your brain will do the same way, the same thing, I should say, for trauma. And I'll give you an example. So many, many people that I see under supervised practice, many of these individuals will call the sky group. And what do I mean by that? So for instance, I will have a practitioner or a client, I should say, and uh, I do have a client and I sincerely, sincerely hope that he does better. I really do. Um, so he stopped seeing me uh, for a while and now he's back. Yeah, so I'm super happy about that. So he refuses to call a sexual assault a sexual assault. He refuses, he will call it anything else under the sky, a sexual assault. So he was sexually assaulted as an adult, right? In his late 20s by his father, right? In his late 20s. According to him, that had never happened before um, when he was growing up. So now as an adult, his father has sexually assaulted him, but he won't call it sexual assault, right? He won't call it that. That is because we refuse to call things for what they are because now they're too real. Now they, we have to accept it. This was traumatic. This was difficult. So that is one of the reasons why I say that a lot of individuals have a hard time calling the sky blue. But then when you go to therapy, your therapist will show you, okay, Let's process this event. Let's process this traumatic experience. And then you'll have a client say, for example, well, that wasn't traumatic. You know what I mean? He was my father and I forgive him, right? So notice that um, with this client, there's a lot of resistance. There's a lot of resistance with this client. Um, but I sincerely hope he does better. I'm really happy. I saw him last week and I'm super happy that he's back. So I sincerely do want to help him out a lot, but we're still in this particular aspect that you see here in your slide, which is right now, we're in the very early step, re accepting that that memory was abusive, accepting it at face value. So any questions about that example that I just provided? Okay, good deal. Now, there is much skepticism, 
right? There is much skepticism about the recovering of abused memories. First of all, you've learned before that individuals can be highly suggestible, suggestible I should say. People can be convinced by a persuasive therapist, right? There's many reasons why this can happen. A therapist is in a authority, in a position of authority. A therapist um, generally has more education about the topic than the client. So that's another aspect that could involve persuasion. Another aspect of persuasion could be because the client is indeed in a vulnerable place, right? They are in a place where they're not necessarily doing their best and not feeling their best. Another aspect of that could be because right now, you're probably the first person that's ever heard this client say that, right? So now you have become somewhat of, of this is a new person that can help me. And because of that, the, the therapist can become highly persuasive, right? So in the example that I gave you about this gentleman, he told me that I was the very first person that he told that his father sexually assaulted him in his late 20s, right? So apparently he never told that to anybody else. And it's not uncommon. So for those of you, there's not that many. How many of you are in psychology as a minor or major? How many of you? All right. So not that many. I see. You. I love you. I love all of you, my engineers and everybody else. I love you too. So in this particular case, you will have that a lot. Sometimes this will be the first time a client is accepting for the very first time that this was a form of abuse. But remember that you played a role, right? Why was it that you were so special? Well, because you can be persuasive. You can be persuasive in, in regards to how a client opens up to you. Matter of fact, you're supposed to provide a non-judgmental environment, irrespective of how it is that you feel as a therapist. That doesn't matter. And I'll tell you right now, for those of you who are in psychology, your feelings don't matter when you're in session. Okay, what matters are the feelings of the client. So because you're in this welcoming, all embracing, all accepting environment, you may be the first person that they say that to, right? Because you're in the non-judgmental place. Whereas they probably never told their parents that they were told their friends because they had fear that they were going to be judged. Now, another issue other than persuasion, another issue could be because we can start monitoring, for example, we can have misinformation effect, right? Whenever a client is presenting information about a trauma or repressed memories or recover memories of abuse, basically what's starting to happen is that we are creating memories, right? And that can happen as a therapist, as a detective. I mean, it can happen as a police officer. This can happen in so many ways because we may feel inclined to try to fill in the gaps of something that the actual client or the suspect or the witness, for example, never mentioned, right? So for example, if I am a police officer or I am some sort of investigator or, or detective, which is kind of funny, my exes, my ex's dad was a homicide detective for like 25 years, right? So he did this for a living. And, and, and we will talk about that um, for a while, right? He's been on that show, uh, The First 48. So he was in that show twice. So it was pretty cool. Um, he's retired now. And unfortunately, he's really, really, really ill, unfortunately. Um, his health has decayed. His memory has decayed. So think about how when he would conduct an investigation and he's talking to a suspect, right? When he's talking to a suspect, su a suspect, he can say something, or talking to a witness, he can say something about, so um, what did this violent guy do, right? But maybe what you're seeing as violent as a detective might have not been violent for that person in the first place. Just like a therapist. A therapist can say, so what can you tell me about sexual abuse, right? And this is the first time the person has even considered that this is sexual abuse, but now you're putting that information in, right? So that didn't necessarily come from the individual, right? Now you're starting to basically start forming memories. Oh yeah, he was violent. Oh, oh yeah, he was aggressive. Yes, sir. Is that what happened with the, uh, let's say the 80s, the original sex abuse accusation? So a lot of people, unfortunately, there was a lot of the uh, uh, witch craze, right? Blaming everything on witchcraft or blaming everything on, on Satanism and things of that nature. 
And then people start connecting dots that were not necessarily there. So yes, that could provide an explanation as to testimonies and say, starting to fill in the gaps of, of information when both um, uh, uh, Wiccan and Satanism are bona fide tax exempt religions, whether or not that's something we align with or not, they are recognized religions that are tax exempt, just like everything else. But then people started pulling in the dots in order to provide a testimony. Um, and unfortunately now we're creating a memory that perhaps wasn't even there in the first place. So you are correct. You are correct. Any more questions? Good deal. I do have a couple clients that identify us, which is in uh, Satanist. So now I have to do a lot of homework because I don't know much about it. So, but that's part of your responsibility as a therapist is to be able to include any person who seeks, who seeks help. All right. So let's talk about the physical aspects, right? The physical aspects of memory, right? Primarily, let's focus first on the hereditary and environmental factors. A lot of people to this day like to argue that things are independent, right? That things are independent. So for instance, oh, my kid is so smart because his granddaddy and his uh, uh, Mima were super smart, so that's why my kid's smart. Or some people would say, oh, my kid is super smart because I put him in this one school in town. This is the best school in the state. So notice that one is arguing for the aspect of hereditary factors, and the other one is arguing for the environmental factors. In reality, to settle this straight, everything has a combination of both, right? Anything psychological will have a biological aspect to it. And memory is not different, right? They both influence behavior, right? We used to believe, we used to believe that only, only environment explained your behavior, right? So what you were exposed to, right? Your, your parent, the parenting, excuse me, your parenting styles, your friends, what you observe, your trauma. We used to believe that only environmental determinants affect your behavior. And by the way, the uh, short abbreviation for behavior in psychology is B, B superscript X. So if you see me doing that, it's uh, behavior. Now, we know, for example, in some examples that I gave you about taste aversion, which is we're eating something, we drink something, and then we have become, basically, we don't want to do it anymore. We don't want to eat that anymore. No, and we know now that there are biological constraints, right, on conditioning, right? We are able to be more predisposed, right, in aspects of memory and learning, right? So it's not simply environmental. Um, when we were covering our chapter Three, I believe, and for those of you watching home, our chapter or a lecture about sensation and perception, we talked about how there are persons who are super tasters, right? And uh, I'm one of them. I'm a super taster, which means that I probably I have 25 to 40 percent more taste buds per square millimeter. Um, how do I know this? Because I volunteered a whole lot in college for experiments. You know, maybe that explains a lot of this, right? Maybe something that it tweak way. But all jokes aside. Um, there is a aspect, for example, if I were to eat something because I'm a super taster, I would be more likely to develop taste aversion saying, I do not want to eat this ever again because it is awful. So notice that it wasn't simply my environment. There is a biological component, for example, of me being able to develop taste aversion, for example. Now, we can't forget about psychology, right, in a social historical context, right? We tend to be, at least in the beginning, not so much now, I feel now we're, we're creating more research. Um, I want to say now we're creating more conscientious therapists that we used to, you know, back in the uh, early, or I should say late 1800s, early 1900s, which by the way, is my favorite era. That's how I've decorated my whole house. My whole house looks Victorian. It's like a uh, travel in time. So maybe one day I'll show you pictures of all the stuff that I've done. But you're not here for remodeling. You are here for how psychology is involved in a social historical context. So what does that mean? It means 
that we used to be very, very research oriented in the sense that, well, this is what research found, right? So if this person experiences these symptoms, therefore this is how this person experiences symptoms. And in reality, we cannot evaluate psychology in a vacuum, just like you would say, for example, conduct chemistry on a uh, petri, uh, petri dish or anything like that. There is a context, right, that surrounds that behavior. So think about Skinner, right? Think about Skinner when we we're talking about positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Notice that in this particular case, his ideas have influence, right? Patterns of discipline, right? So we have actually utilized Skinner's ideas of positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement in order to change the patterns through which we discipline children. Now, if you remember from operant conditioning, right? Something being perceived as rewarding or not has also managed how we conduct management. So for those of you who are in business, a lot of the practices that you do in business are based on operant conditioning, right? Because we have placed much emphasis on reinforcement. Now, in, in, a, in an acute example, right, um, that I was explaining to my friend this weekend, we, we hung out, uh, we had a good time, and then when we, I was looking up videos to show for the class for um, schizophrenia um, later on, because I think that's one of the more interesting, especially disorganized schizophrenia. There's three, type, uh, three main types, catatonic, uh, disorganized, and paranoid, and if you're wondering, paranoia is the dangerous one. Paranoia is the one that the client can actually come in and attack you because you went from Dr. Shar to a demon in 0.3 seconds. So you can go in really fast. But when we were talking about schizophrenia and psychology as a social historical context, you and I, common good old American folk, our hallucinations tend to be really negative. Our hallucinations tend to be really violent, right? In our social historical context. So if I'm schizophrenic, right? And if you're wondering, I'm not, not schizophrenic, um, but for individuals who are schizophrenic and are American, generally their hallucinations tend to be immensely violent. So for example, they would say stuff like, burn the building down, kill yourself, go kill your family, you're worthless, you're stupid. Whereas in other cultures, your hallucinations are pretty benign. They'll say something like, Oh man, my grandma's talking to me and she says she loves me so much. My grandma's right here, you can't see her. My grandma says that she loves me. So their hallucinations tend to be really benign. Whereas in the American context, they're very violent most of the time. Tell you that you're stupid, that you're worthless to kill people. So that's why we need to understand the social historical context, even for the presentation of something that's clearly um, very influenced by biological aspects. So any questions about that? Is it the same in Europe as far as the negative hallucinations? So interestingly, depending on the historical context, so for some individuals, say um, some of the minor USSR countries that split up, that tends to be a little bit more uh, violent. But if you think about it historically, the context that they have to go through, uh, even before USSR was a thing, uh, there was a lot of, of violence involved in those cultures, for sure. Whereas in other cultures, they're super benign. It's like, hey, grandma's talking to me. You can't see her. She's right here telling me that she misses me and she's going to bake me some cookies. So is it the cult because the culture is violent or is it because the association with mental health is negative? I would argue both. I would argue both. Um, but if I had to pick one, it would be the historical context. But I would argue both. All right. Any more questions? Good deal. Schizophrenia is, uh, is rare. You know, um, uh, one in 100 people have schizophrenia. There's a lot of hunger people in this class, by the way, if you're wondering. So one of us, ding, 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 one of us probably will develop symptoms of schizophrenia. I'm too old now. Um, generally, schizophrenia tends to manifest itself in their in your early 20s, early 20s. So fun little fact. There's only one gifted person, though, in every thousand, what we commonly refer to as genius. So there are more schizophrenic people than geniuses, is what I'm trying to say, statistically speaking. I put both of them together. <laughs> Good. All right. That's the kind of client I'd like to see. So 
Let's think about the neural circuit, circuitry of memory. Now, interestingly, your memories, right? We like to think about how a memory, oh, I'm going to store uh, how much I love my grandma here. And then I'm going to store um, how that told me how to change a tire here and how mom showed me how to check the oil here. That's not at all how memory works. Generally, whenever we are thinking about memory, we start generating a reusable pathway, right? We start generating basically almost like a spider web in how we start developing our memories. This allows for those signals, right, to flow whenever we are thinking about memory. Interestingly, because it is a physical, I want you to think about say a, a map, right? Think about um, how different highways connect to each other. That's basically your brain when it comes to memories. Because of that, it will alter, right? Because it's changing those paths. It will start altering the synaptic transmission, right? And if you recall from one of our first chapters, right? You'll remember that a neuron Whenever they start connecting to other neurons, they do it through a, a synapse. And the synapse was that little gap between one neuron and the next neuron. So your synapse is right here, right? So that change, when you start creating new memories, you're going to have different forms of connections. So remembering, studying, actually physically changes your brain, right? When you're learning how to drive, when you're learning how to do anything and you're trying to store it in your long-term memory, it's literally going to change those little highways, those little roads, right? It's going to start physically changing your brain. How does it do that? It does that through neurogenesis, right? We consider that neurogenesis can start sculpting, right? Those little circuits, right? Those little spider webs, those little ropes that you are developing in your brain. And consequently, they can have an underlying factor on how memory, the memory process is conducted. So any questions about that? Any questions? Yeah. Yes. So all the memories have are just the physical connections between neurons. Is that when someone has like some type of traumatic brain injury and they get MDs or whatever? Is it literally just breaking those connections? It could be. So the question was, if you have a TBI, a traumatic brain injury, and you start forgetting things, is it because you broke those connections? That could be one explanation. The other explanation is that memory doesn't occur on its own, right? So memory depends on, remember, um, say, um, every time you smell this perfume, right? You, oh, I remember my first statement, so-and-so. Every time I smell, I don't know, uh, Chinese fruit, right? Because my first day was went to a Chinese buffet. Remember, the memory is just not the circuit, right? It's also the sensory information that you associate with it. So if for some reason that part of your brain becomes damaged, now you can use that sensory information to remember. So that could also explain why you forget. Would that be how imposter syndrome works too? Well, we'll talk about that whenever we start talking about um, psychopathology, well, which is going to be a long way from now. It's going to be a long way from now. So what's keeping us from being able to go in to someone's brain and disconnecting those that pathway? It's just because we don't know which pathways do what? You can map them, actually. We are able to map them through MRI, and we are able to map actual circuits. We can. Um, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily stopping anyone. If I had to take a wild guess, be the ethical concern about being able to manipulate your memories through surgery or electricity, for example. I would think it's more the yeah. ethical aspect of it or the legality for that matter. Uh, fun little fact, um, it's better to do an MRI as a lie detector test than it is because the pathways of memory and one, the ones that are activated. So yeah, we can see them for sure. We can see them. Is it ethical to change them? <laughs> you know, that's, that's, another, that's another question. I mean, isn't that just what therapy does? Well, changes them over a longer period of time. Well, I wouldn't change your memories. It would be more the perception of said memories. 
right? So for example, viewing something as traumatic and going to therapy to not view it as traumatic. The trauma is still there. I didn't change the memory at all. I mean, the trauma exists, right? But changing your perception about the trauma, you can go to therapy for that. I mean, the memory is still going to be the same regardless. I can't change that memory. What I can change is my perception of it, right? Can I view myself as a victim or can I view myself as a survivor? And once you do that, how are you going to carry on your life being a victim or being a survivor, right? So that's what therapy would do. Does that answer your question? Kind of. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's move into declarative and non-declarative memory. Very simply put, right? When we declare something, I do declare. If I declare something, means I am speaking it, right? Consciously, right? That means it handles factual information. I am declaring something, right? I am declaring something. This is your basic recollection of words. If I ask you, define what a car is, right? Names, what is the capital of the United States? What day you were born, right? Notice that these things I can declare, right? These things I can actually speak factually. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. In the sense that it's factual, in the sense that you can declare, right? Like it's in the ether of the universe. Like even if my opinion is right or wrong, you know, like I can declare this to you, right? Um, it's in the ether of the universe. It exists, right? So I can declare it. When we're talking about memory, that is. Now, if you're thinking about cognitive distortions, that's a whole other story. Because now the how factual your thought is matters, right? Whether or not it is factual that I have little demon clowns dancing behind me because I'm schizophrenic, right? So that would be a little different. Now, let's talk about the non-declarative memory. Conversely, if declarative memory is that I can actually state it non-declarative memory. I'm actually not stating it, right? It's memory that I show for my actions, right? So for example, your skills, right? If you paint, if you draw, right? If you code, how fast you type, right? Notice that these things, you're not necessarily declaring them, right? You're not declaring how fast you're typing that code for your computer engineering class, you're not declaring how you know where to do your brush strokes whenever you're painting or drawing. You're not declaring if you're driving a car, okay, now I put it in, I put it in, put my seatbelt on, turn on the ignition, put it on drive. You're not declaring these things, but clearly you remember them, right? Clearly they are part of your memory, but instead of declaring them, you're showing them through actions, right? You're showing them through actions. Some examples can include riding a bike, right? You're not declaring how you ride a bike. Okay, I'm gonna put my left foot on the seat, right? Put my products down, put my right pedal on the, uh, my right foot on the pedal. Notice that you're not declaring these things, but clearly you do remember because you are showing them through action, right? You are showing them through action. Generally, um, these things, Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to recall where you learned them, right? Like if I were to ask you, um, how is it that you learned to type? Um, a lot of people would say, well, I just, I just typed. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know exactly how I learned. Or for example, if you ask someone, okay, where did you learn how to draw? It's like, I don't know. I, I just drew, I don't know, when I was a kid. I don't know. Sometimes these are a little bit more difficult to recall. Not impossible. But these are a little bit more difficult to declare because... That's not their point. Their point is to serve for the memory of actions. Any questions about non-declarative memory? Good deal. I do remember when I learned how to drive stick because it was awful. My uncle taught me. He would yell at me the entire time. Ah, the shift and the gear and the clutch. I'm like, okay. All right. So if we revert back to our slides, now we can actually start dividing our declarative memory, right? So we had our declarative memory. And notice that when we break our declarative memory down, 
that turns into episodic memory and semantic. So let's talk about our episodic memory. Notice that remember, declarative memory is that that you declare. Episodic memory, right? Episodic memory. What we're doing is we are declaring that information almost like an episode, right? You're declaring the chronological recording of things you have done, seen, or heard. Pretty much like an episode on Netflix, right? An episode on Hulu. So, for instance, you can tell me about, say, what you did this weekend, right? So, for example, I did a lot of clothes shopping uh, this weekend, particularly just like day clothes to like hang out at home, stuff like pajamas, things like that. So, that is part of my declarative memory because I can tell you, right? I can tell you exactly what I did, right? I can declare it. But it's episodic because I can tell you, okay, I got up, I hung up with my friend a Friday, then um, we went out, and then we went to sleep, we met up, we went to hang out, and I wanted to buy some clothes. So I knew there were a lot of 50% off uh, specials going on. So notice how I'm declaring this, like it's an episode, like we got in my car, didn't take my convertible, we took the SUV because I found a lot of stuff. We drove to so-and-so, we went to so-and-so town. So notice this is episodic memory because I am declaring this to you like it's an episode, right? Like it's a movie, right? So that's what we refer to episodic memory. <clears throat> now, notice that conversely, we also have semantic memory, right? Semantic memory. Here, we have a little bit more of that general knowledge, right? We have a little bit more of that general knowledge. Notice that in this particular case, we may not necessarily recall when it was learned. Right? You may not necessarily know. So for example, if I were to ask all of you, what's the capital of the United States? That's general knowledge, right? You will be able to tell me that. But if I were to ask you, when did you learn this? A lot of people have difficulty. Was it in kindergarten? Was it in first grade? Was it like two days ago? Because I have no idea, right? So notice in this specific case, yes, you do remember, but it's a little bit difficult to tie it back to a time in which it was learned. So notice in your, I can declare, right? I can declare that semantic knowledge, but I may not be able, right? I may not be able to, thank you so much, you're a lifesaver. Look at that. Fantastic. All right. So any questions about those two types of declarative memory? So any questions? Good deal. Fantastic. Now, something to recall, right, is when we were talking about retrospective memory, right, we were talking about retrospective interference and prospective interference. Let's talk a little bit more about retrospective memory. When we're thinking about retrospective memory, you're remembering things from the past. You're remembering things that have previously occurred, that you have previously done. Now, with prospective memory, right? is remembering to do things for the future. It almost sounds like an oxymoron, right? Because like, how am I going to remember something from the future, right? So for example, say, you know, your roommate, your mom, your dad, your significant other, boyfriend, girlfriend, boo, whatever kids do these days, whatever partner you have. And so your partner tells you, hey, don't forget to grab some milk when you come back from campus. You're like, yes, remember milk, milk by the store after, you know, after you come to class. And then you forget, oh, man, so you forgot technically something from the future, right? You forgot something that you had to do, right? Forget like, oh, man, I have a quiz. Oh, man, I have a paper due, right? That's perspective memory, forgetting about something that you were supposed to do in the future. First time I heard that term in my life, I was confused. I'm like, what do you mean you remember something from the future? That's impossible. It hasn't happened. Oh, I get it. Because it's basically a performance, right? A performance of something you're supposed to do. All right. Good so deal. Do those 
to differ from uh, the formative one. Um, what's it at? Okay. So getting perspective memory and retrospective memory, forgetting to pick up the milk, wouldn't that, why is that not just forgetting that you were told to get the milk? And <clears throat> so the memory, uh, so the question is, why is it not retrospective? Because retrospective would be failing to remember who told you to get the milk because that's something from the past, right? That would be retrospective. So if you remember to get the milk, but didn't remember who told you, you right? Would be, you would have you didn't forget the perspective memory, but you forgot the perspective. Correct. So his example was: so if you remember to grab milk, but you can't remember if it was mom, if it was your sibling, forgetting who told you, that's in the past, right? So that would be retrospective, right? But if you forgot to grab the milk, that would be prospective, right? Because that was something from the future, but forgetting. Uh, uh, who told me? Who told me I had to grab it, or where did I have to get the money for the milk? Right, those things will be considered from the past. But forgetting to buy the milk, that would be a prospective. Or if you forgot what you were supposed to get, but you know you're supposed to get something. Right, that would still be prospective. Like saying, I know I have to go to the grocery store. I know I have to go out to class. I can't remember where I was that I need to get. I remember mom telling me. So remember that is retrospective. But now I can't remember what I was going to get. That would be prospective memory. A lot of you take a psychology course, and I hate to admit that, but a lot of you take a psychology course for yourself. So I hate to admit that, right? A lot of people take this course. It's like, that's interesting. Maybe I'll learn a thing or two about myself. You know, maybe I learned something. I need to remember. I need to remember you, remind you, I'm not your therapist, <laughs> right? So uh, I can do those things. I am your beloved instructor, but I can't do those things. But that's not to say that we don't have some personal application for this class. Now, interestingly, we do have ways to improve our memory, right? We have ways. And we have talked about some of them before, particularly rehearsal. Right, but let's talk a little bit more about mnemonic devices. Right, <clears throat> this example would be just another strategy to enhance your memory. Right, this is one of the processes that we would do, for example, to use noises, right, to remember sounds, for instance, and how they can help us remember stuff. So, for instance, some people um, say. Uh, let's see. Let's see. I hate to admit it, but I love Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion. Like, I think I'm bad, you know? So imagine that I have to study, right? Or I have to do something. And every time I study, you know, I have, you know, Cardi, you know, singing in the back or whatever. Then when I actually have to remember that material, whenever I'm taking the exam, I'm going to be thinking about Cardi, right? So that's going to help me remember the material, right? So that is a possible way that you can learn sort of things. I know at least when I was in college and graduate school and doctoral school, for some reason, whenever I would study, right? And I would study from the book, I would remember, oh, the professor is asking me this question, right? But my device, right? My device to remember was, I remember that was on top of the page. And I think there was like a sad kid at the bottom or there was a, a bar chart at the bottom. And that would help me a lot for some reason, because I had a mnemonic device in order to remember, right? So that's why some instances of organizing your materials can also be beneficial for everyday learning. We have talked about rehearsal. Before. We have talked about rehearsal. And this is when we are going to improve that retention, right? We're going to improve that retention. So if you remember, for memory, we do encoding, then we move towards uh, storage, right? And then we move towards retention, right? And we have it uh, retained, but we need to rehearse it, right? We need to go back to that little warehouse, right? We need to go back to that little warehouse and do some inventory, if you will. That's what rehearsal would be. It would be basically like if you're working at a factory and you're doing some inventory control, you are rehearsing, you're going back, retrieving this information because 
we're able to start moving those aspects of short-term memory. We can now move them towards a long-term memory. The more we rehearse, for those of you who are in arts and in performing arts and theater or musicians or you play uh, instruments, you understand the value of rehearsing. Those new notes, those new uh, script lines, those new musical notes, everything that is in your short-term memory through rehearsal, we're able to move it into a long-term memory. This is really interesting. A lot of people, uh, and I'll give you a real life example of this, me using this specific theory in real life. The serial position effect. So I mentioned psychology doesn't have a lot of laws and things of that nature, but every now and then we come across one of those. This is when the position, right? The position in which you are presented something will affect how much you remember. And what does that mean? It means that the things that were at first or were at the top, right, or happened first, are more easily remembered than things in the middle, right? Or things that were at the very bottom or last, we tend to remember those too. And I'll give you an example. Say somebody sends you a text message, hey, get milk, get bread, get sausages, get butter, get this, 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 and that. And then one of the last things is like, oh, get cookies, right? You're probably not going to remember much of the middle, but you're probably going to remember, hey, get butter, and hey, get cookies, right? Because of the serial position effect. Things that are presented first or things that are presented top and bottom, we tend to remember a little bit more. And I'll give you a real life example, right? I'll give you a real life example. So I also teach in another, well, I technically don't teach anymore. I'm asked neither. But in order for me to get that job, I was asked, when do you want your interview? And I said, okay, when do you guys start? Well, we start at 7.30 in the morning, and then we're done at 5. And I said, give me the 7.30 in the morning. Why is that? Because I was going to use the serial position effect into my advantage. They were going to remember me, <laughs> right? They're going to remember me because I'm going to see, be the very first person that I saw from the interview. Conversely, I will be the last person to say, I want the five o'clock. I want the five o'clock slot so they can remember me for that interview. And I did. I did get the job. I got the very first appointment that they had, and I got the job, right? Because it's easier for people to remember things that occurred at first or things that occur last. For example, if it's better for you, um, if you're having a hard time with a class, if I can't remember any of this, try to take that class really early. So take, try to take that class really late. It's the first thing that you do in the morning or the last thing that you do in the morning, because generally we're able to remember the information whenever it's placed at the very beginning or at the very end, and we tend to forget things that are not in, in, in the middle. We tend to forget those things. So any questions about that? Does that also explain why people are usually... Like if they can't remember the name of a movie or a person, like I don't remember, but it started with a M. Yes. All right. Any more questions? Good deal. And I'll see you beautiful people Wednesday. <laughs>